welcome to the Creative Constitution podcast. I'm talking to Andrew Walsh, an amazing director and filmmaker, and this episode is all about distribution and getting your work out there. Hello, Andrew. Hello. We've spoken about How Deep is the Ocean and the process involved in creating your first feature film. So this time, let's talk about what you would do with the film once it's finished. The file is ready. The edit is done. You've exported it. You're proud. What's next? Well, what's next is hopefully find someone to buy it. Otherwise, you know, I'm going to go to the grave. No one even know, know it exists. <laughs> so it's the process is often really different for short films and feature films, right? Yeah. So what's that like for short films for you? Well, short films are different because short films make no profit. They make absolutely no money. You know, nobody, nobody wants to pay to buy them. Whereas feature films, obviously, you know, there is, there is some financial possibility there mm. to make things very complicated. I mean, um, this is the thing, you know, like short, short films go to festivals, then they die at festivals, that's it. You mm. know, there's no future. Whereas a feature film, it's going to live forever. Whether it's going to be a profitable or not, that's a whole different thing altogether. But feature films live forever. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm going to be under the ground. Probably my, my daughter's grandkids will be watching How Deep Is The Ocean at some point. That's an, that's an interesting perspective. I mean, short films, yes, you're right, they have a, a shorter lifespan, mm -hmm. but it sometimes can be a great tool to use to get a feature film made, which then can leave that sort of legacy that you've, you've spoken a, a about. So with your previous short films, so you've done quite a few, what was your distribution strategy with them? Um, well, look, we, 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 play, we tried film festivals. It really, that's just like throwing money into a toilet. With no result, we got not. I think, I think I remember growing out. Probably our most successful one that was the fourth one. We that one ended up getting like a hundred projections, and we only got like three out of a hundred. That's a pretty. So that pretty was a hundred submissions. Ratio. Yeah, I kid you not. I think wow. three festivals played us, and we got received a lovely email. Yes, the audience liked it. Yada yada yada. But after that, nothing happened. I mean, I re mean, what, 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 what I found really was when we started playing on TV, that's when things started to get really, really interesting. So how did that happen? Tell me about, about that. Yeah, sure. Um, so down here in Victoria, we have a community television known as Channel 31. Uh, they're very supportive of the film community down here in Melbourne. They've got quite a few shows. And because um, I remember when... Um, how it started was my third one we played at the Melbourne Underground Film Festival, I can't remember the year, and then they decided to have a best of muff, best of the muff, best of the Melbourne Underground Film Festival, and they played that one on uh, Channel 31, and apparently 30,000 people tuned in. That's wow, a pretty good number. I mean, a lot of Australian feature films, they play in cinemas across the country. They won't even touch those kind of numbers. So, I mean, festivals aren't... Festivals are, are not a light at the end of the tunnel anymore. Mm. Like I'd argue the festivals are really irrelevant. I mean, digital, digital streaming is the future. Yeah, right. Because festivals have always been kind of the, the, the main distribution platform for short films for a long time. But I yeah. think as the amount of content has grown, it seems to have lost a lot of its, uh, its impact on filmmaker careers. What are your yeah. thoughts on, on that sort of myth in a way oh, i wouldn't know I never, I never really thought about doing this as a career it's always just been a thing that i've been being compelled to do i never wanted to do it for the money well but i think um as a filmmaker you mean like you that that was never really something that you intended to do not to do it as a career i just never saw it as financially feasible because i didn't think the stuff i want to i want to make the stories i want to make and I'm aware that in the marketplace, you know, my stories probably aren't financially feasible to a lot of people. But that's okay, though, because I have things which I need to express, which I can't live without expressing these things. Mm. So it's your form of art. Yeah. Yeah, I'm still waiting for that, that emotional catharsis to come along. It's been 20 years, still waiting for it. <laughs> sure, we'll get there eventually. So with the short films, you had one go really well. Let's talk about that one. 
Yeah, sure, sure. Well, I, I had a couple that, that went, went really well, but, you know, well is a hard word to define. So, for example, you know, obviously when the comedian got played at Cairns, that was a really big deal for us. But it's really the, 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 the grassroots shows we had here in Melbourne that really got us out there. I think we got played in Sydney at some point as well, at some sort of event over there. Where else did we play? We played... I can't even remember. So these grassroots events, was that something that you accessed through Film Freeway? Like, was that a submission? Uh, no, exactly. No, this 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 was 10 years ago before Film Freeway really was a thing. Mm. But uh, basically, there was a lot of people in Melbourne making films, and we needed an avenue to show our works. You know, we'd have, um, you know, we'd, there'd be like warehouse parties where you play your films there. Yeah, you know, art galleries and stuff like that. You know, we just go go to go to a bar. It's got a projection screen. That was really how we we, we got a lot of gigs. We we go to a bar and basically say, "Hey, mate, I know you got a projection screen over there. We're filmmakers. We want to play our films. How about you let us have this room for a Tuesday night, five dollar entry, and you, you keep you keep all the profits? How's about that? That's no one's going to cool. turn that down. <laughs> That's and that's something that that probably could work really well today as well. I mean, when everyone is doing festivals, mm. I always think if everyone going is right, you should go left. You know. Yeah, look at it, day. You need to get your work out by any means necessary. Like I said, no one else is going to do it for you. You need to do it for yourself. So even if that even if that that means you know, you might set up a gig and you know, one person shows up. That's one more than you had last week, so mm. that one person will go tell their friends about it. Yeah, you, you, you got just got to keep planting seeds everywhere you go. You need to train your eyes to see the opportunities before you. Because mm. at the end of the day, you know, where it's two thousand twenty-three, you've got all you've got everything you need to succeed and get your art out there. It's up to you to utilize those tools. That's Once correct. Again, no, no one else will do it for you. And if, and if nobody picks up how deep, deep is the ocean, I'm just going to go back down that route. I'll tour it around the country if I have to, just going from bar to bar, you know, playing on little screens like that. Mm. Yeah, you, need, you need to be willing to do absolutely anything to get your stuff out there. So what are you currently doing with How Deep is the Ocean to try and secure distribution? Are you going to film markets? Are you emailing people? What's kind of been your process? Oh, uh, we're just we're just emailing people at present, as I can't really afford to go to the markets or the festivals or anything like that. Mm-hmm. We've had a few offers, but the offers have been pretty crap, for lack mm. of a better word. It doesn't feel justified for the amount of work we put into this, so we're going to keep pushing until we get something that's beneficial for all of us. But um, you know, it, it's interesting. A lot of time, we're we're the ones getting approached, like because obviously we have a big buzz on the social media and all that. I mean, they're approaching us rather than we're approaching them. I mean, that's a sign we're onto a good thing. That's really good. And have yeah. they been finding your project through Instagram? What's been the, the, the best social uh, network? IMDb somehow. I don't quite understand how IMDb works. They all seem to find me through IMDb. Oh, okay. Maybe because you have your status is almost complete or, or maybe? or. Oh, I don't know. My, my, my producer does all that. I don't, even, I don't even know how to use IMDb. <laughs> So does the producer do most of the finding the contacts for you in this situation? Um, it's like 50-50. Like my producer, Dia, find, finds a few people. And uh, my, my uh, editor, Ivan, who I made my short films with, he's done many, many feature films now. He's got a lot of contacts. He's given us a few names to contact. We're in the process of doing that now. And uh, hopefully we'll we'll see what we see. But yeah, but I think I think a best case scenario, we just need to get on the streaming platforms, like the good ones. Like you look at Netflix, I would die for the film to be on Netflix. Mm. Sometimes it seems like such an impossible journey, but I mean, you hear the stories all the time. We recently saw Talk to Me do amazingly well after a Sundance premiere. So there's mm. definitely so many opportunities for filmmakers these days. It's, it's even interesting because those guys are from Adelaide. When I was living in Adelaide back in the early 2000s, there was nothing happening. There was absolutely nothing happening. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I left and moved to Melbourne. But, you know, like I said, this day and age, you can, you can do it from anywhere. Like, I grew up in a town called Wyala, which is five hours north of Adelaide, very small regional town, about 22,000 people. 
it, it, even they've got their own film festival now. Wow. There you go. That's yeah. very cool. I mean, you can, you, you can do, do this from anywhere, but whether you're going to be financially successful doing this, that's a whole, whole different matter. What do you think those factors kind of that, that come into play into whether you're going to be successful as a filmmaker or not? Like, what do you think are those elements that a filmmaker needs to have? Hmm. Talent. Talent. Longevity. Uh, the ability to communicate, you need to, con you, just the thing, you need to be able to convey to every single level, whether that's directing your actors, that's dealing with your cinematographer, or where you're dealing with sales agents or distributors, you need to be a very clear, clear communicator on what you can and can't do. Mm. And be very clear about what, what, you're, what, you're not, what you're not willing to do. Yeah. For example, you know, like if, so, right, if someone you need to says, have barriers. If someone says, you know, we're, we're going to distribute this film, but you, you need to cut, you know, five minutes of it, I'd be like, absolutely not. Mm. I'm not cutting a single thing. Right. Does that happen very often where you might get dangled a distribution deal, but in order for that to happen, there's heaps of like requirements? and. Well, we, we, we had one recently from a company, or I'm not going to name, Basically, they they wanted to take our film for six years, a six year contract. Yet they expected me to do do all all the marketing for the film. I'm like, well, dude, that's your job, isn't it? That's often the, the most expensive part, isn't it? Exactly. Like I've made the film; it's your job to sell it. If I if I, if I could market my own stuff, I wouldn't be coming to you now, would I? Mm. And no. No, that that's that's just a, that's just an un unreasonable request, in my opinion. Yeah. So no, we didn't we didn't take that one. Right. <laughs> what are your thoughts on on filmmakers using YouTube and sort of those those free platforms to upload their films to? Oh, it's bloody great! It's excellent. It's making it accessible for everybody. I mean, me, me personally, I've never had any, any any luck on YouTube. The short films have been there for ten years, but they've picked up no traffic. Believe me, I wish I could crack the code. And mm. Yeah, but uh, Dia Taylor, she, her, on, her on the other hand, she has YouTube very well. One of her short films, I can't remember, I think got one million plays at one point, which is wow. crazy. But no, you, you, YouTube is, is good for everybody. It's pretty crazy how big a film can get in a very short amount of time on YouTube. Oh, look, when you look, look, look at our trailer, you know, it's got 1,600 plays. I don't expect to get about five, and it just keeps growing every day. Mm. I don't quite know how to seize control of the algorithm, but, yeah, it's, it's a thing of its own. Wow. No, YouTube all day, every day. So with, with platforms like Tubi and Film Hub and all that, have yeah. you had any experience using those? Um, I haven't, but I know a lot of people who have. Apparently, Tubi is a very, very good one. Uh, Film Hub's a good one because apparently you, you keep a lot of the profits unlike a lot of other streaming platforms. Mm. Are they yeah. difficult to get your work in there? Yeah. Uh, put it this way, I, I've seen a lot, a lot of films on those platforms that I don't think are great. But those people probably see my stuff and they're not great either. I think in this day and age there's room for everybody there's room for every kind of conceivable film or story i like that that sounds good yeah it belongs to everybody you know yeah so when you're preparing your film for distribution what are mm. sort sort of the requirements that that you need to kind of almost like a checklist tick off yeah well there's a lot, lot of um technical requirements because obviously they want things to be a certain standard I can't remember them all off the top of my head. There's a uh, sound test you've got to do. There's lighting tests you need to do. Uh, obviously, subtitles and things like that. I, I, w I want to chat a little bit more about the short films yeah, because sure. that's where a lot of beginning film, like beginner filmmakers, will yeah. be at still at that stage of making heaps of short films. And with creating a short film, sometimes I can take little money, no money, or heaps of money. So with the distribution aspect to get their work seen, in your personal opinion, what is the best way to get their work out there and just to start getting some interest for potentially more work as a director or yeah. 
Yeah. Well, it's funny. It's funny you just say that because I got a message just the other week about some director trying to trying to crack crowdfunds for a short film. I'm like, all right, it's fair enough. Looks like I'm gonna try look down. Now look at the figure. Ten thousand dollars. Ten thousand dollars for a short film. What? Dude, make a feature film with that money. Do you think no. it's possible to make a feature on ten grand? I think it's possible to do anything on ten grand. Well, there's a will, there's a way. That is quite a bit of money, to be honest. I mean, I've made short films for under a thousand dollars, pretty much all of them. Well, this is the thing. Like the, the the comedian was our cheapest. They only cost me fifty bucks that day because I had to buy everyone lunch. Wow. Everything else we got for free. We got very lucky. And and that was that was your your the the short film that probably went the furthest as well. So yeah. it really goes to show that you don't need a lot of money to do something really cool. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You mean if you think in terms of just financial, you're going to be very disappointed for the rest of your life. You know, you need to adapt. You need to improvise. You know, maybe maybe you need to write out the car chase out of your script. They put something else in there instead. Yeah. But, I mean, it was, it was good for me because, you know, after making five short films without any money, you know, making a feature film without any money wasn't like a radical step for me. Mm. And I think, art, I think art fries with limitations. I do agree there as well. Yeah. You kind of, it, it stretches the brain to come up with unique ideas that you can do on, on the existing budget. I mean, one great example is... We couldn't get a courtroom for my first short film. Yeah. I, I tried my best. I emailed every single courtroom mm. in Queensland. None of them either, well, pretty much all of them rejected me or ignored <laughs> me. So eventually we had to decide, okay, are we going to remove this from the story, yeah. which would make the film make very little sense, or are we going to try and find an alternative? So then yeah. I ended up going to Bunnings and finding like a board pretty much like a wooden board that looked quite similar to what a, a yeah. courtroom looked like. And we used that as the backdrop and just cut out a lot of the extras that yeah. would be in there, you know, like the lawyers. and Just like get a board, get, get like a nice low angle, make the judge look really powerful. Exactly. All that, do lots of close-ups. Exactly. Pretty much all of it was close-ups because we couldn't do any of the other shots that I had That's envisioned. When, 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 all, when, when all else fails, just do close-ups. <laughs> that's the, that's a good tip that's a good tip yeah. it makes your it makes your movie look more cinematic too yeah exactly uh, people love to use the word cinematic but i um i do agree that oftentimes if you have a really nice lens and you just do close-ups it just looks amazing like it it can do so much in boosting your production value well that's the thing people aren't people aren't expecting perfection they just want something that's going to be good but one thing they are expecting i've learned you need good sound you know, if your uh, cameras aren't great, the lighting's not great, but the performances are good, the audience will forgive you for that. But if you've got shit sound, they will not. They will mm. not forgive you at all. Which is frustrating because sound is the most expensive aspect of doing a film. There's so much that goes into it too, like the sound effects, the music, yeah. the dialogue, all, all of it. It just, I mean, all parts of filmmaking is technically quite complex so exactly getting it all together every, every, every single job is more punishing than the other <laughs> you know you, you, you don't just rock up and go action yeah no you're doing 50 other departments and you know it begins and ends with you as, as the director i would love to know how big your crew was for how deep is the ocean how big was my crew oh man i think um 13 days it was about 40 of us, actually. Yeah, 40. That's a really big crew. Yes, it was. But, you know, well, some, some days other people wouldn't be available. Someone else would, would take over their spot. But, yeah, don't quote me on that. I think it was about 40 people. That, once again, is all down to, to, to Dia Taylor. You know, she can do anything. Sounds, sounds like an amazing project to have been a part of. So that's really, really cool. And then with... With kind of YouTube, Film Hub, festivals, mm. I'd love to know kind of what your your critical thoughts are on festivals and how short films can either like have success there or kind of the costs involved. I mean, what are your thoughts on all of that? 
I honestly think that 2023, I think short film festivals are largely irrelevant because we've taken their power away and we've replaced it with these streaming platforms like Tubi, Netflix, Amazon and all this stuff. Because mm. that, that's that's the end goal. You want your festival, you want your thing you played at the festival to go further, to go to a platform. But nowadays, we don't need the festival. We can go straight from A to B. And that, that's, a good, that's a good thing for everybody. Mm. Oh, it's not good for the older generation of gatekeepers, but it's good for you, it's good for me, it's good for everyone else. So festivals were mainly the, the gatekeepers, essentially. Absolutely. Yeah, 100%, 100%. And do you think that rings true for feature films as well? Or mainly short films? Or I think, it's, I think it's both, really. I mean, you look at Cannes and Sundance, all, all, all the major ones. Any person gets played there, they've already got the connections to begin with. You know, it's very unlikely you see, you know, an obscure guy from Melbourne getting a film played at Sundance, you know. Yet you, your you, film played at Cannes, so. Lot, yeah, but a lot, lot, lot of good that one did me. <laughs> but the fact that it's gone there, I mean, that yeah. must have given you quite a big boost on your resume. If you were ever to go to a, an investor, I'm sure that these are almost like little badges. Mm. Yeah, it's a little badge. It's a very tiny, tiny, tiny badge, which you can't see, you can't zoom in on the camera. Yeah, but I mean, it's a very interesting perspective that you've got because mm. so many filmmakers believe that they'll get into Sundance or Cannes, yeah. and then that's that's going to be what sets them up. Well, you know, we have, we have, we have to set ourselves up. You know, we can't wait for any, someone, someone to do that for us. I think at and the I, end of the day, we have to get our films in front of audiences. And there are do. so many, so many ways of doing that. Exactly, exactly. I mean, you, you've, you've got, you've got on, online platforms, you know, you've got arts events here. I'm sure you've got plenty of that in the Gold Coast. You know, you've got, uh, you've got film nights, you know, networking at the universities, things like that. They're, they're, just, they're just a few. I mean, every, every gig I've had, I've, I've just come come right out and say, ah, do you, do you have anything going at the moment? Can I play my film? Yeah? Mm. All right, we'll play next week then. I mean, that does take a bit of courage, but all filmmakers need a bit of courage to go and approach people and ask for Oh, it's terrifying. I don't, I don't enjoy doing it. I mean, I get I get anxiety doing all of this stuff, but it's got to be done. You know, so I have to overcome my fear and do it. Because as I said, if I, if I don't fight for my film, no one's ever going to see my film. Exactly. I think one of the great the great things that I've seen online of like filmmakers getting their work out there yeah. was I was watching a video. Um, it was about this guy who had created his short film. And what they did was he rented out a theater, like a yeah. cinema, and he got a bunch of other filmmakers to also kind of show their short films. So yeah. they ended up getting, I think, like 10 short films together and they sold tickets to the audience. I think it was only like five dollars each or something like that. But it adds up, be- though, but it, it all adds up because those ten films probably had ten crew at least each, and then they bring their friends, their family, and all of a sudden everyone's got a bit of money that they can put back in their pockets to yeah, recoup exactly. some of the costs. Well, I, mean, I mean, look, it, it begins and ends with networking. You can't do any of this on your own. You know, exactly. you, you, you need to work together. You need to work with people who've got the same goals as you have. You know, if you're working with people that don't have the same goals you have, it's, it's just like trying to climb a mountain with your bare hands and these guys have just got you up by, by the legs. You know, you need to find like-minded people, have the same goals, have the same values because they'll motivate you to get better and you, you're going to motivate them to get better. And it also seems like not every distribution method works for everyone. So one short film may have an excellent festival run, whereas yeah. the other might not. That doesn't mean the films are bad. Um, yeah. It just means that maybe the festival was not looking for that sort of content. Well, this so- is the thing. You know, when, I, when I say short films have a short shelf life, sometimes, you know, sometimes there are ex- exceptions to the rule. You know, like my film, The Comedian, I used to get an email once a month, you know, for years saying, oh, I found this on YouTube, I really liked it, blah, blah. I think one was as far as bloody Israel and Dubai, I think, yeah. 
It's wow. great. Yeah, you can create something of this obscure $50 short film in South Melbourne and it goes all the way over to the Middle East. And, you know, and another thing about having it all online is, you know, new, new generations are going to are gonna discover it. Yeah, that's true. I mean, and also if it lives on YouTube, you never know. It might all of a sudden... Um, a video could be going viral that's similar to your short mm. film and then the a, it, the algorithm just magically ends up suggesting it to everyone that's watched that video. And then you yeah. might have a completely new run on your film. Well, exactly. It's not this documentary I saw about this um, punk band in the early 70s called Def. It was three African-American brothers in Detroit and they, they made what was the first punk, punk rock album which bombed and they never went anywhere. But then somebody discovered it in vinyl like 40 years later and found these guys and they end up reforming and now they're enjoying a huge success. It's a long-term game. You know, it might take you to the day you die, but it's a long-term game. It's awesome. And Andrew, let's, um, let's wrap up. So do you have any suggestions for filmmakers who want to get their work seen and their work out there? Just go for it. I know it sounds really simple, but just buddy, go for it. You so know, talk about it, share it, talk create about an Instagram it, share page, it, connect with people, get 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 out there in the real world, have a real live screening. Cause they're they're exciting, much more exciting than just watching on YouTube. Yeah, hustle. I mean, you well, first, first thing you need, obviously, you need you need, you need a product. Your product is your film. Then you need to sell the product. And you need to sell that to everybody, whether it be, you know, you know, venue owners, you know, venue owners for one thing, you know, community groups, things like that. Like, um, I live in the suburb of Brunswick down here in Melbourne, and we were, we, we, we were, we think we were ranked the most creative suburb in the entire country, I think, what was it, 10 years ago or so. Wow. There, was, then there, there was a lot happening. We, we, we used to play in like warehouse parties. I actually had, a, I played a gig at a art gallery once, which is really funny. And it was, it was like a wild rock show. Like our short films are playing, you know. There's blunts being handed out, popcorns everywhere, red wine everywhere. There's a dog running around the ground. <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> oh man, that, that was a good gig. I'm surprised I can, I can even remember that gig. But it was a good one. Wow. Well, there you go. I mean, opportunities are are everywhere for yeah. you to get your film out there. So I hope we've I hope we've uh, discussed some good distribution tactics and and some some tips here with Andrew Walsh. Thank you so much, Andrew, for joining the podcast. This was Creative Constitution, and we'll see you in the next one. Thank you.